Hello, I'm Dr. Sharon Hayes, cardiologist at Mayo Clinic, founder of the Women's Heart Clinic, and director of the Spontaneous Coronary Artery Dissection Clinic. Today, I'm going to talk about spontaneous coronary artery dissection, what it is, how it's different from atherosclerosis, and what we should be thinking about as we care for these patients. So what is SCAD? SCAD isn't atherosclerosis. So it is a dissection or a separation of the intima and media of the coronary artery, often not associated with any or only very little atherosclerosis. It presents as either an intimal flap, as you can see on the far right, or an intramural hematoma in about 80% of the cases. As you can see, if we were to do a luminogram, as in a coronary angiogram, the intramural hematoma can look very similar to atherosclerosis. You may say, why are we talking about SCAD so much more in the past decade? Well, in part because we were taught prior to about 2010 that the way to diagnose SCAD was with that intimal tear only. We now know that about 80% of SCADs present with an intramural hematoma, so we were missing 80% of them. What else is different? Well, SCAD is different from atherosclerosis in its demographics. The average age is considerably younger, ages 42 to 52, 90% women. About 5 to 15% of women are peripartum. Now, we used to think it was higher, but that's probably because we were missing many of the non-peripartum SCADs. Cardiovascular risk factors are uncommon and much lower than those individuals who have atherosclerosis, but they're not absent. Actually, hypertension um, is present uh, at about the same rate it is in the population. It's also not rare. As I alluded to, we were missing it. It represents probably about 1 to 4% of all heart attacks. It's the number one cause of pregnancy-associated myocardial infarction and the number one cause of MI in women under 40 and perhaps under 50, where it makes up over 7% of myocardial infarction. It also isn't benign. You know, when we first started looking at this, patients were being either, either being told, um, go on and live your life, this is no big deal, or alternatively, you're lucky to be alive because um, most people die. And that part of that was because most of the literature up until about 10 or 15 years ago was in the pathology literature. But about 50% of SCADs present as STEMI, about 15% as uh, uh, in cardiac arrest, and about a quarter of individuals have multivessel SCAD at presentation. SCAD can recur. It isn't just a lightning strike that will never happen again, sadly, at about 2 to 3% per year. We unfortunately do not have a lot of risk stratification options. We can't tell individuals, oh, you're at high risk or particularly low risk, haven't found those risk factors yet. We know that traditional treatments for acute coronary syndrome, and in particular PCI, may cause harm. The success rates are far lower, and the complication rates, uh, particularly related to abrupt vessel closure and extension of the dissection, are much higher. And there is long-term some significant um, morbidity and major adverse cardiac events. The other important thing, unlike atherosclerosis, is it often heals without treatment or intervention, which is why we, we sort of focus on what we can do from a conservative management standpoint, because many of these individuals will do well. There are rare familial cases, but we know that there is no single SCAD gene, only some people predisposed and no secondary prevention strategy yet, other than good blood pressure control and, in fact, trying to achieve normal blood pressure. So where does SCAD fit in? Um, we sort of look at this, is there some associated conditions? Um, and those include pregnancy, as we've mentioned. We'll talk more about associated arteriopathies like fibromuscular dysplasia, susceptibility genes, so not a single gene, but just like atherosclerosis, genes that may make an individual more susceptible to dissection. Um, inherited arteriopathies like vascular Ehlers-Danlos, and then other factors. Um, it does appear that there may be a higher rate of hypertension, preeclampsia, infertility, and migraines in patients who have SCAD, but not we don't understand the mechanism. So we take those associated conditions and perhaps a trigger or perfect storm, such as pregnancy, sex hormones, intense exertion or valsalva or intense emotional stress, that may um, contribute. About 25% of individuals have a, a recognizable trigger of either intense exertion or emotional stress. 
So what do we need to look for? First of all, it's important to remember that SCAD presents very similar to other types of heart attack, like chest pain, shortness of breath, VF, all of those things. The challenge is the index of suspicion is often quite low because these are young, healthy-looking individuals. So we need to maintain that index of suspicion, get the troponin and ECG. And then the way we actually make the diagnosis is with coronary angiography. We recommend careful coronary angiography after intracoronary nitrates to make sure we are not fooled by spasm. We're looking for intramural hematoma, that flap or tear. But sometimes things are indeterminate. So if we're not sure at the time of acute diagnosis, Sometimes uh, optical coherence tomography or intravascular ultrasound can be helpful if it's safe and feasible, patient stable, but at a risk of propagating the hematoma. Coronary CT angiogram afterwards, particularly if there's a proximal coronary involved, can help differentiate and exclude calcium and atherosclerosis. Sometimes if it were well after the fact, we're looking retrospectively, imaging for arteriopathy could be confirmatory or repeating coronary angiography at four to eight weeks, recognizing that that may raise the risk of iatrogenic harm. I think it's also important, some of you who are familiar with SCAD may be familiar with the type one, type two, type three, and even type four. Um, those are angiographic appearance types, not physiology. And so I think it's more helpful and more related to prognosis to say either intimal tear, so that's when we see a flap, or type 2 and type 3 are both types of intramural hematoma, just differences in size. And it's important because those actually have prognostic um, implications. So once we've made that diagnosis, remembering the primacy of conservative management. So this algorithm, uh, which comes from uh, the uh, American Heart Association scientific statement on SCAD, um, is, is looking at if the patient is clinically stable, they don't have high risk anatomy, which is left main or, or two proximal severe um, dissections, then conservative management is desired, but we monitor the patient for three to five days because of early extension of the hematoma. In those individuals with high-risk anatomy but are stable, we can still watch them, but we should also consider cabbage and not doing PCI, which would be very complex. If they have active ongoing ischemia or hemodynamically unstable, sometimes that rock in a hard place and we must do PCI, but urgent bypass surgery um, certainly uh, is an option. And remember that the major um, goal is restoring flow and it's not to make that vessel look pretty or perfect. Um, it may have some ongoing healing. For early after, we watch for symptoms. Some of these individuals, as you see in uh, the, the diagram, if they have intramural hematoma, it may expand, particularly if uh, anticoagulants are used, and it can lead to occlusion if it uh, decompresses by forming a tear, um, they often do better. Managing symptoms, often with vasodilators, um, and extending that hospitalization, we generally use beta blockers early at least for a year and possibly longer, and aspirin. I alluded to the fact that most of these patients have a, a diagnosable extracoronary arteriopathy when we look for it. Most commonly, it is fibromuscular dysplasia and abnormality of the um, uh, media layer, the muscle layer of the arteries, that often presents as a string of beads, as you see in the, the center, the uh, angiogram related to the femoral angiogram, um, can also have uh, other dissections and aneurysms. And obviously, sometimes there may be aneurysms or dissections either in locations or of a size that need monitoring. So we recommend, and it is recommended, that individuals after a SCAD have a one-time imaging, preferably with CT angiography, but also MRA is helpful, um, from brain to pelvis. Ultrasound is insufficient to, um, to cover all of these uh, different vascular beds. Um, some other issues that I wanted to bring forward is that chest pain after SCAD is really common, more common than chest pain after atherosclerotic MI. And these patients tend to have high rates of emergency department and inpatient chest pain evaluations. I think it's also important that the chest pain they experience is not always ischemia. Sometimes it's chest wall. Sometimes it may be related to the dissection itself. Also need to consider restenosis or stent issues. And finally, some will have new or recurrent SCAD. 
So they need a com comprehensive evaluation. The other um, aspect is uh, that many of these premenopausal individuals have menstrual cycle variation in their chest pain, which many cardiologists uh, are not familiar with. So we recommend an individualized approach, recognizing that there's an iatrogenic risk from repeat coronary angiography that must be balanced with the importance of a proper diagnosis. So stress testing can be helpful to exclude fixed obstructive lesions like stent stenosis. Um, the coronary CTA can uh, assess the proximal coronaries, um, which may be all we really need to do in terms of risk stratification. Um, sometimes empiric nitrate use is, um, is very helpful um, and is almost a poor man's diagnostic test for po possible coronary vasospasm. So um, these individuals have clear nitrate responsive chest pain, but may pass a stress test and do very well on either uh, long acting nitrates or calcium channel blockers. And obviously if symptoms persist, cornea angiography should be performed. Other things to consider, obviously FMD and its associated conditions and complications that may require treatment. There's a significant psychological burden um, of having SCAD. We've known for decades that the highest risk group for developing depression after a myocardial infarction are women under the age of 60, which tends to be this demographic. So addressing those issues is important, often with cardiac rehabilitation. Women experience losses, particularly reproductive options, because we recommend that they don't get pregnant after SCAD, and at least for a year, just like for any other myocardial infarction. Recurrent SCAD risk is present even if the initial SCAD was not pregnancy related. So we recommend using an effective, i.e. not a simple barrier method, um, contraception, non-hormonal, and the levonorgestrel IUD is particularly attractive, um, particularly if individuals have menorrhagia because it decreases menstrual blood flow. Uterine bleeding uh, is a uh, is relatively common, particularly in those individuals who we've had to stop their oral contraceptives or who we put on dual antiplatelet therapy. And again, that levonorgestrel um, IUD or uterine ablation um, can be very helpful. And again, this is something that's not always on cardiologist radar. And importantly, cardiac rehab referral. This is important because I have heard from many SCAD patients that their cardiologist said, oh, you don't need cardiac rehab because you were already fit before that. And I think importantly, because of some of the mental health benefits of cardiac rehabilitation are important. So after, um, after SCAD, uh, we start uh, cardiac rehab one or two weeks after the event. If they have a large infarct or, or a, a, a very proximal uh, dissection that is treated conservatively may wait a little longer. Um, we recommend avoiding high intensity competitive sports, um, endurance and exercise to exhaustion, high intensity activity, particularly in extremes of temperature. And we do recommend strength training long-term, um, but using lower resistance and higher reps. Um, and limit lifting, whether it's in the gym, the home, or in the yard, uh, to items that require straining or valsalva. So we don't give a definite weight limit because that's very individual. We aim for a normal or lowish blood pressure and consider medical genetics referral, although only about four or five percent of SCAD patients have um, identifiable monogenetic mutation and providing support for the patient and the family. I wanted to talk just a little bit about our prospective registry because we are still in, enrolling. We have over 1,400 individuals um, in our uh, registry. It's a virtual registry, so individuals do not have to come to Mayo to be in the registry. They'd have to have an angiographically uh, confirmed SCAD. We send questionnaires and ask for a personal SCAD narrative. We do have some perspective aspects, particularly for individuals who come to the SCAD clinic. So we have uh, looking at echo and other um, radiographic uh, aspects and hopefully some prospective clinical trials. So to summarize, we will, if you're not already, see more SCAD because of increased awareness and intravascular imaging. We must have an index of suspicion for young women who don't have cardiovascular risk, who have the symptoms, and making a correct diagnosis, differentiating from atherosclerosis or spasm is even more important because the management is different. The burden of recurrence is high, as well as the morbidity uh, and uh, associated with it. There's a strong association with systemic arteriopathies, and therefore screening should be done at, at least one time. 
aim for a normal blood pressure, often using a beta blocker as a preferred agent, and referrals are welcome to both the Mayo Clinic SCAD registry and to our Mayo Clinic SCAD clinic. So I welcome you to learn more about SCAD as an important cause of myocardial infarction, particularly among younger women, that we have a lot yet to learn about. Thank you very much.